All right. Good morning, everyone. I uh, hope that you're having a great morning. I certainly am. This was very special for me this morning. Uh, I was a swimmer growing up, and I actually swam with Mark Tewksbury in the same pool, not close to him. He's way faster than me. <clears throat> so this morning we were doing rehearsals, and Mark was on stage, and my picture was above him, so I snapped a picture of it. It's the first time in my life I was above Tukes on stage. It was epic. So no matter how this talk goes, it really doesn't matter, because that's trending on Twitter right now. I'm having a great day. <laughs> Tukes doesn't know that yet. Anyway, back to the Olympics. So summer of 2012, I'm a physio I was a physiologist, still am, and I was working with some of Canada's Olympic team in preparation for the London Olympics. And we were in Florida, and I was working with Canoe Kayak, and specifically Adam Van Coeverden, who's one of the athletes I've worked with for a very long time. And I'm not sure if you know this or not, but the closer you get to an Olympic Games, the less hard work you do. You want to have no injuries, no fatigue, no stress. And so this was to be Adam's last really, really hard workout. We went a set of 16 times four minutes, all out on two minutes rest. So imagine sprinting for four minutes and then chilling out for two minutes and doing that over and over and over again for two hours. Super fun for me because I get to do all the blood work and the heart rates. Uh, and in my Zodiac, I'm dodging dolphins. Awesome for me, not so much for Adam. And when I was explaining the set, he swore at me, which is fine, because so, I went and found the number two person in the world at the time, Anders Gustafsson, who's in black. Adam was number one in the world at the time. So I got the number one and number two people in the world together right before the Olympic Games. And they were flying up and down this river. It was incredible. And in, in addition to doing my blood work and measuring heart rates, I snapped a few pictures, this being one of them. And it was just an incredible day. I saw this picture, and then I was flipping through my shots at night when I got back to the hotel, and I saw this picture. And as soon as I saw that picture, I said, you know what, I think Adam's going to win the Olympics. Can you see the difference between them? Look at their faces. Do you see how Anders is stressed, tense, anxious? Look at their hands. Adam's gripping the paddle, holding the paddle with three fingers, like tea, pinkies up, drinking tea with the queen. Uh, you tap the paddle and it goes flying, where Anders is gripping the paddle for dear life. So keep this in mind. They're the exact same level of athlete. They've both broken the world record. They're going the exact same speed at the exact same time of day, at the exact same point in the training cycle. Everything is exactly the same, but they're doing it in two completely different ways. Stressed, nervous, tense, anxious, fearful, or relaxed, focused, energized, determined. I believe that there's a completely different way of working. And I want all of us to consider the fact that the way that we're working in our world right now isn't working. We have 25% of our population with a diagnosed sleeping disorder. We have 58% of Canadians with overweight or obesity. We have 85% of Canadians, everyone just started taking notes, that's good, thanks for that. <clears throat> Makes me feel better. 85% of Canadians don't get enough physical activity to prevent a chronic disease. That's not even to be healthy, that's just not to get sick. The numbers just came out for children. It's 4% of girls and 9% of boys get enough physical activity to prevent a chronic disease. And the number that even though it's the lowest scares me the most is one in five Canadians will access the medical system at some point because of a mental health related challenge. That terrifies me as a father of two young kids. But I, I do believe that there's a solution. And the solution is to do the opposite of those four grand epidemics. Not only does that enable us to perform better and make that fundamental shift from going through life like honors to going through life like Adam, but it enables us to be healthy as well. And the pivot is to sleep soundly, eat smarter, move more, and think clearly. Four steps that counter the grand epidemics and also enable us to reach our potential. That's what I'm going to try to persuade you of in the next 16 minutes and 17 seconds. Here we go. Diving right into it, I want you to talk, I want to talk first about sleeping soundly. And I want to draw your attention to the lymphatic system. The lymphatic system is a parallel circulatory system inside the body. You all have this, it runs right next to your arteries and veins. It's full of a clear fluid called lymph. Lymph flows through your body all the time. It picks up viruses, bacteria, broken down cells, waste products, pulls it into your lymphatic system where white blood cells from your, from your immune system fight off all those invaders. This is the system that keeps your body healthy. It's a system that keeps your body clean. It's why your doctor feels the lymph glands in your neck to see if you're fighting off a cold or the flu. It's why we're concerned about breast cancer spreading to the lymph nodes in the underarm. This is an incredibly important system. But if you look at that image, you'll see that it's present in the stomach, chest, arms, neck. It gets up to about the cheeks, and then it stops. It's not in the head. 
And up until very recently, science, medicine had no idea how the brain accomplishes what the body accomplishes in terms of keeping itself healthy and clean. And some research was done that shed some light on this topic. We've done, I do a lot of MRI imaging at the Hospital for Sick Children. It's a part of our research program. And we're able to capture these incredible, beautiful images of the brain. And what we've discovered, uh, some researchers in the United States have discovered, is that at the microscopic level, we have 100 billion neurons. And these 100 billion neurons, every single night while we sleep, shrink by about 60%. And all the space opens up inside the brain. And a clear fluid called cerebral spinal fluid washes through the brain every single night while you sleep. That was imaged for the first time about two years ago. You can actually see the penetration of fluids into the brain when we're sleeping. It's absolutely incredible. The other discovery that was made is that we have a network of lymphatic vessels that line the inside of the skull, and they're connected to the lymphatic system inside the body. So every single night while you sleep, the brain literally washes itself out and drains itself. It's kind of like taking a dirty sponge and sticking it under running water and squeezing it over and over and over again until the brain is cleaned out. That happens every single night while we sleep. It's absolutely incredible. But we have a society level problem when it comes to sleep. We, have, we all do this. Well, not all of you. I'm not accusing all of you of doing this, but the vast majority of you, I'm going to guess, probably do something like this. Here's why this is such a huge problem. This is an MRI scan of the brain. It's a slice through the head at the level of the eyes. You're looking at it from the top. If we zoom in, you can actually see the eyeballs up top there. It's really quite incredible. When we have these devices and we shine them through our eyes, the light goes through your eyeball, hits the back of your eyeball, that part I've circled, part indicated there in blue, and a structure that looks like this that converts light into electricity. That electricity passes back through the optic nerve into a structure called the pineal gland, which releases a hormone called melatonin. Melatonin controls your sleep-wake cycles. So when we shine these devices into our eyes late at night, we are signaling electrically to the pineal gland that it's morning, it's noon, the sun just came up. And as a result, you don't release melatonin, making it very difficult for you to fall asleep quickly and deeply. So we all need to create a barrier and defend the last hour before we go to sleep at night to enable us to fall asleep quickly and deeply. We have to do things differently in order for us to, re to reach our potential, but also, very importantly, to be healthy as well. First thing in the morning, if you wake up and you're having a hard time going, by all means, grab your phone, shove it right in your face. <laughs> I'm fine with it in the morning. In the afternoon, phone's away. All right, second idea. <laughs> Thanks for that laugh, that's great. Uh, <clears throat> second idea that, that I have for you is eating smarter, and we're gonna stick with the brain for a moment. I'm, this is an MRI scan of one of my students' heads. We found the brain, it was actually in there. And we, <laughs> um, I had to check. And so we took, imagine taking a camera and zooming in to the tissue up top. It looks something like this, 100 billion neurons, each with thousands of connections. And it's at those connections where thinking takes place. Electricity zooms down to the end of the neuron, triggers the release of neurotransmitters that move back and forth and carry thoughts, problems, concentration, focus, music, basketball shots, everything happens at the neurotransmitters. And what we've discovered over the last five years or so is that the foods that we eat during the day influence the type of neurotransmitters that are created inside the brain. And if we eat foods that are higher in protein than carbohydrates, we narrow our focus and we can concentrate more easily. If we eat foods that are high in carbohydrates and low in protein, we widen focus and relax. So contemplate how you feel an hour after having a chicken salad, for example. Clear, sharp, focused, everything's good. Or an hour after having a big, huge plate of pasta. Happy. <laughs> Searching for a place to have a nap, right? Very, very, very different physiologic responses. We need to do things a little bit differently. Sticking with the brain, I think that there's some tremendous potential for us to actually leverage the fact that we can use healthy proteins to help us work and do our best work more easily. I love the idea of having a protein for breakfast and lunch. I'm not anti-carb. There's some incredible sources of carbohydrates that are packed full of fiber, vitamins, minerals, which enhance our health. I just believe we need to decrease the amount of sugar and processed foods that we consume because they negatively affect the hippocampus. The structure that I've circled there in red that's responsible for learning. Research shows that high sugar, high processed food diets shrink the hippocampus. And it also results in lower BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor that stimulates the growth of new neurons inside the brain. Lower cyclic AMP, the energy currency inside brain cells. And lower synaptin mRNA, the genetic code for new connections between neurons inside the brain. It's incredibly powerful. We can fundamentally rewire our brains if we eat healthy and we can actually protect our brains by eating healthy fats. 
If you look at the tissue on the surface of the brain, this is an image of, of actual surface of a brain, if you look at the tissue, it's white. The reason why it's white is because your brain is largely made up of fats. Specifically, omega-3 fatty acids, which wrap around the branches of neurons inside your brain and protect them from damage, just like bark on the branch of a tree. It's absolutely incredible. I'm gonna step out of my presentation for one second. I have to tell you this story. I gave this talk at a school about three months ago in Victoria, BC, and I gave a talk at a school, and afterwards one of the teachers asked me, can you please do this talk for the grade threes? I'm like, I don't talk to grade threes. I have one, they're terrifying. I don't do that. <laughs> <clears throat> he said, please, please, so I did it, and this little girl insisted on sitting on my foot <laughs> for the presentation. I got to this slide, and she pulled on my leg, and I looked down, what's up, sweetheart? She goes, yes, and myelin speeds the transmission of electrons between neurons in the brain. It jumps from breaks in the neurons, and it actually speeds up nerve I was like, who are you? <laughs> and can I invest in your company? <laughs> true story. Just like we have problems with using our phone devices and sleep, we actually have a fundamental problem with nutrition in our world. This is an image that I took on an expedition that I did to India a few years ago. I took a group of youth ambassadors there and we ran with Impossible to Possible and Ray Zahab's group, and we ran 300 kilometers through the Thar Desert in the northwest corner of India, right near the Pakistan border. It was stunningly beautiful, and kids came to our campsite every night. We were there to investigate issues related to world health on behalf of the World Health Organization. So one day I went into one of the villages and I found this gentleman, gentleman selling all the traditional Indian foods. You'll notice the entire spectrum of the rainbow is there, all fresh, anti-cancer, anti-heart disease, anti-type diabetes, anti-metabolic syndrome, anti-depression. There is an entire field that's emerging now called nutritional psychiatry, the use of foods to treat mental health issues. Like it's all there and it's perfect. I took that image, I turned my body 90 degrees and I took this image. And as those types of foods are permeating into China, India, Brazil, Malaysia, Kenya, our businesses, our schools, our homes, the diseases of the West are following cancer, heart disease, type diabetes, metabolic syndrome, depression. We need to vote with our pocketbooks. We need to do things differently. We need to approach food as fuel for our performance and fuel for our healthy lives as well. The third idea that I have for you today is to move more. And we know that exercise does wonderful things for our bodies. Uh, I was bored one day at work, so I jumped in the magnet, the MRI, pressed go, and MRI'd myself. That's my insides. So <clears throat> it's your tax dollars at work, ladies and gentlemen. So anyway, don't tell anyone. I actually did a talk with the Minister of Health was in the room. I didn't know. I made that joke. Didn't go over well. Anyway, so. <laughs> You can see my lungs up top, the heart, liver, digestive tract, all of those get better when we exercise. We get more red blood cells, which carry oxygen around our body. We, our mitochondria work better. These break down foods to create energy for you. We get better muscle function. We move fluids through the lymphatic system. People who walk 15 minutes a day have 24 to 40% lower risk of breast cancer and colon cancer. People who exercise daily have 75% fewer colds and flus. It doesn't need to be hard. Walking it doesn't need to be that long, 15 minutes. Any movement dramatically improves our health. It also lengthens and strengthens your telomeres, which are caps on the end of your DNA, just like aglets on the end of your shoelaces that prevent your DNA from breaking apart. Telomere shortening and DNA breaking apart is one of the primary theories behind why we age. 55-year-old runners have the same telomere length and strength as 25-year-olds. Exercise literally keeps your DNA young. But here's a really interesting insight that's happened over the last few years. This is the electrical activity inside the brain of a zebrafish at rest. Watch what happens when it starts swimming right here. The whole brain comes to life. Stop swimming, brain shuts off. Start swimming again right here. The whole brain comes to life. That relationship is true for every single species on the planet, including humans and even teenagers. So <laughs> think about how we teach kids in school. Sit down, don't move, pay attention. It doesn't work. Think about most workplaces. Sit down at your desk for nine or 10 hours and then go home at night. And then we wonder why we're tired, wonder why we're fatigued, wonder why our productivity as a nation continues to decline. We must do things differently. There's a reason why Steve Jobs always did his meetings walking around. If I read, I read Walter Isaacson's biography of Steve Jobs. He never did meetings sitting down. 
There's five articles in Harvard Business Review that show a direct link between walking and creativity. In order for us to reach our potential as human beings, we need to move more. But we know that push-ups are good for us, but we don't always do them. So I want to show you an, a video of Ingrid. This is my daughter. We do a lot of rock climbing and other risk-based activities. Because <clears throat> I'm a huge fan of fear and failure for kids. <laughs> Everyone laughs at that, but I, I think that our inability to allow children to fail is one of the reasons why we have an anxiety epidemic in our world right now. So I appreciate that. So this is Ingrid. And I have to announce everything. It's like, you have to announce me. And I have to Ladies say, and gentlemen, Miss Ingrid Wallace is about to climb all the way to the ceiling. This is everything now, getting in the car in the morning. She has a confidence problem. We're working on it. So um, she takes off to the top here. And when she gets to the bottom, something really cool happens. She doesn't hurt herself, don't worry. She had a brain injury a few years ago, so one of the reasons why we do a lot of this is because I love exercise coupled with mental tasks. So this is part of the process for healing her brain. And when she gets to the bottom here, something really interesting occurs. Watch her face right here. Happy, confident, proud, joyful. Contrast the look on her face right there with the typical look of someone at your gym on the elliptical. <laughs> Pain, suffering, sacrifice, constipation, bad, 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 right? We've totally forgotten that actually exercise feels good. Go for a walking meeting. When you're on the phone, stand up, take your family to the park on the weekends. Hardest workout I've ever done. I took Adam, my four-year-old, to the park for an hour. I did everything he did. It was awful. <laughs> 20 minutes in the sandbox like this, deep squat, and pouring sweat on the fire truck. Bad. <clears throat> All right, final idea that I have for you today is thinking clearly, and I want to show you, tell you the story of this picture right here, and I know it's black. So uh, two years ago exactly, my wife sat me down for dinner, and she said, we need to talk, which is interesting. Pour the wine. And uh, she said, I've been hiding something from you <laughs> for eight years. And I'm just mainlining wine at that point. <laughs> so I know you've always wanted to swim with sharks. So I've been saving up $100 off every paycheck for eight years. And I've got you a trip. We're going to go fly to the Indian Ocean. We're going to go swim with sharks. I'm like, thank God, it's just swimming with sharks. It's awesome. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, it's our 10th anniversary. I need to get a gift. So, just transparent. The guys are laughing. The women weren't on that one. So, we fly to the Indian Ocean. We get there, it's, uh, unpack our things at the, at the place we're staying. And just says, we need to go swimming with sharks. And I'm an adrenaline junkie. So, I'm like, perfect. Sun's going down. They eat at night. Let's go. So, we go into the ocean. And the scuba instructor takes us down to a wreck, and it's stunningly beautiful. There's fish everywhere. I'm a, I'm a swimmer, and so I'm holding on to the wreck, just totally relaxed, huge current. Fish everywhere. Turtle goes by. Nemo swims by my face. Like, it's amazing. And then being the adrenaline junkie that I am, and it's getting dark, it's getting nighttime, I turn off my flashlight because I want to be in the ocean at night in the pitch black. And that's that picture. I took a GoPro shot. It's black. And then, have you ever had the feeling like someone's watching you? <laughs> So I flip on my flashlight, point it out at the deep where I felt something, and then this happens. Six foot, black tip reef shark. Apparently it's harmless, whatever. I'm freaking out. <laughs> I will remember every single detail of that experience for the rest of my life because everything in my brain was totally focused. All of my attention was on that shark. Everything else in my life ceased to exist. Judith? <laughs> Gone. I believe that our ability to focus and control our attention enables us to live life at the absolute limits of what we're capable of. And yet we go through life, unfortunately, addicted to these.
And I'm not anti-device. You have the entire history of all human knowledge on your phone. I'm not anti-social media. The Me Too movement happened on social. As the father of a little girl, I'm super fired up that that happened. It makes the world a safer place for her. But we do client meetings with our phones out on the table. Or God forbid, you have dinner with your family and you take a call or text someone. It is taking away our ability to live life to its true potential. We need to do things differently. We can do things differently. And I believe that if we do those factors differently, very specifically, sleeping soundly, eating smarter, moving more, and thinking clearly, that we will reach our potential as human beings, our health will be dramatically improved, and ultimately we'll be able to overcome those four grand epidemics that the world is faced with. Hope you'll join me on this journey. If you need any help at all whatsoever, you can get in touch with me in any way. I just want to make this happen globally. Anything that I can do that I've brought up for you today that triggers a question, comment, feel free to message me. I'll get back to every single person if I possibly can. Thank you so much for your attention. Really appreciate it.